The time has come to crack open the ancient tomes once again. This is a land of myth, magic, and silliness. It's time to look more into the races of Dungeons and Dragons. Hello everyone, I'm Kestrel McKnight. And I'm Tim Gwynn, and you've joined the party of Pillars of Adventuring. Last week we talked about the primary four races you'll find in the Player's Handbook, their stats, and some basic lore, and we are thrilled to talk about the next five out of the Player's Handbook, as well as a bit of their lore. But first, we have announcements. Yes, we are both big into the lore and the background of D&D, and we're going to be launching soon uh, some episodes that we'll be talking about the lore of Toril and of Faerun in general. Um, these are going to be for flavor um, and helping you build up your campaigns with tips and secrets of the world and helping you as players as well as the DMs to navigate the world while not um, having to invent everything, uh, especially from scratch. Um, so this will not, not be a separate channel, uh, but instead it will be a new feature to the one that we're already doing and we'll be running that very soon. So keep your eyes open for that. That one's likely not gonna be a live stream like we're doing here. Um, unless we decide to otherwise, uh, but we may do question and answers on that later, but definitely, yeah, um, definitely want to get stuff on that. Lore is huge, lore is big, and there's only a couple places that really dive deep into it, and we want to be one of those. Now, if you would like to support us, there are a few things you can do. Uh, first, follow our Twitch TV, so my personal Twitch TV slash Kestrel underscore McKnight for our live broadcast. I host this little extravaganza live each week, as well as our live D&D sessions over the weekends. Um, the second thing, and equally important, is to like, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell in the YouTube video. This way you won't miss a minute of our advice or content, and you will be among the first to know when a new video drops. Speaking of being among the first, you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash pillars of adventuring all one word and so check that out now we have pretty lofty goals to be honest um, for what we want um, so that we can help you all and your support will allow us to do that honestly in order to make this full time for us we're looking for the Patreon to run about $4,000 a month um, because this is going to help us improve the quality and the speed as to how and when we put out our content. And it's great. We've got a little bit of something for everybody on there. So patreon.com slash pillars of adventuring. All one word still. Um, it, it means a lot just being here and watching that that you do so if you can't donate or don't want to donate but still want to help out easy and other easy thing is spread the word share our videos share the twitch right. that's a big thing now without further ado the following races are more uncommon meaning that outside of the major cities these races can be met with suspicion have a harder time blending in disguise and deception can have the dm's impression be made Harder. These five races that we have left to talk about are the Dragonborn, the Gnome, the Tiefling, and the Half Orc, and the Half Elf. Not in that order. I know I said four last week. That's my fault. I can't count. For that, I apologize. But I do not apologize for the Dragonborn. <laughs> this is not like the Dragonborn in Skyrim. These are actually humanoid dragons, not humans that have dragon ability. They are born of the dragon, as the name suggests, through a process, and as to how that process happened is up for debate. Some say it's the, Dracanic, the Draconic gods forging them for a servant class of two dragons, or shock troops for them. The dragonborn have finally made their way to the material plane, and thus have started carving their own path. 
the Dragonborn's scale will reflect their draconic ancestry, though their personality doesn't always align with the traits of the true dragon they descend from. To a Dragonborn, the clan is the most important thing, more than even their own life, and more than the gods themselves. Their clan is paramount. Each Dragonborn knows their place within the clan, and honor demands maintaining the bounds of the position and upholding their duties within it. They also have an innate drive for self-improvement, which is reflected in the self-sufficiency of their race. As a whole, they hate to fail and strive for excellence in everything they do. Though while prideful, they aren't so proud as to not accept help when they need it. Failing because of pride when someone, be they mortal, divine, or even not dragonborn, is lunacy to the dragonborn. And though they tend to be insular, keeping to themselves, right, and going to other dragonborn first, they do reach out to other races and peoples beyond their clan. Yes, and one of my favorite dragonborns is in the um, in the uh, um, Brimstone Angels series, um, Farida and Havilar's father, um, Clanless Mahan, and um, he is one of the coolest characters I think I've I've read about. Um, and again, kind of prideful, but not so proud as to not ask for help from his tiefling foundling um, daughters that he raised. Um, so as a player, um, as a dragonborn, your heritage is shown in practical ways. Uh, you get a plus two to strength and a plus one to charisma. Uh, young dragonborns grow quickly, um, walking within hours of being a hatchling. Um, and then by age three, they look to be about the size of a 10 year old human and reach adulthood at the age of 15. They live to be around 80 years old. So they're pretty, they're pretty close to human um, as far as lifespan. Uh, Dragonborn tend to go to extremes. Uh, they pick sides in the cosmic war between good and evil, and rarely do they seek a middle ground. Um, they usually side either with Bahamut or Tiamat. Um, so most Dragonborn in Faerun are good, um, though those who follow Tiamat are absolutely terrible. Um, and they're typically villains. Uh, the dragonborn are generally taller and heavier than humans, the shortest among them being about six feet tall. Um, some have been as tall as eight feet, um, but they average, and they average around uh, 250 pounds. They're medium creatures with a walking speed of about 30 feet. Um, dragonborn Dragonborn do get a breath weapon that they can use that ties into their draconic ancestry, um, whether chromatic or or um, uh, metallic. Check the, the dragon... table on those because we could have gone yeah. through all of them, but there's the <laughs> table. Please check that. It's, it's much easier to reference. It very much is. <laughs> um, and this attack actually levels up with you, so. Um, and the save difficulty is eight plus your constitution plus your proficiency bonus. It will do 2d6 damage until the sixth level, and then it gets even stronger from there. Uh, you also have damage resistance, the same as your draconic lineage. So if you have the black dragon, resistance to the poison, Bronze Dragon, Lightning, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, next. Ah, love this. The Devil Child, they're often called. Um, and and in one campaign, it was a homebrew campaign, um, we were called the Vexies. The Vexed. Um, Thanks, man. That's Tieflings. Um, tieflings are outside of the main cities treated with um, mistrust, fear, derision, and more often than not, absolute hatred. Um, to twist the knife even further, 
every single tiefling knows that it's because of some pact that was struck with the dark power, usually Asmodeus. Um, and that is the reason they're cursed. Their appearance and their nature are not directly their fault, but the result of an ancient sin that someone in their family did, which the next generations are doomed to suffer. Tieflings are derived from human bloodlines, and I use that in the loosest of terms, actually. Um, they still look human, mostly. Their skin color can be the whole array of human tones, or they may have varying shades of red or purple in the mix. Um, my bard, for instance, that I play in Tyranny of Dragon, and all tieflings have large horns, which can take various shapes, and, well, they kind of make hats um, damn near impossible. Um, they, pretty... they, don't, they don't account for horns when making hats. Yeah. Um, and such as my tiefling bard has um, ram's horns that come out and curl around his his um, his head. So um, they also have very thick tails that can be up to five feet long, and they have been known to lash quite a bit when they get a little nervous or upset. Uh, their canine teeth are sharper, and their eyes are solid colors, black, red, white, silver, or gold. And they have no discernible pupil or sclera um, because of their outcast nature. They tend to be pretty self-reliant and independent. Um, they have no homeland. Uh, their families have been marked as betrayers, uh, though they are typically some of the most loyal of companions. Skladba will give his life for the group that he's traveling with. Um, most tieflings do grow up to be petty thieves or other criminals, and unless they're taken in, many go on to become something even darker due to circumstance. Now with Skladba, he was raised in a family that loved him, um, he was raised in a nomadic family, um, trained in the ways of, of bardism. And um, basically, we call them Stroth in our campaign, but basically he's a gypsy. Um, and uh, so he was raised with, with um, good upbringing, to be honest. Now, it, it is important to make a distinction between Tieflings and Cambrian. Um, and there's a lot of confusion in there, and I spent a lot of time researching on it. And it can be up to DM discretion, because there is no clear and cut reason for it. Um, tieflings, by most accounts, are not created by breeding with a devil or a demon but a stain upon the soul based on a demonic act. So it's a magical curse that goes through the bloodline. Mm -hmm. Cambrians, they're bred. They're half-breed devil human or other creatures. Usually an incubus or a succubus seduced a mortal and then the half devil is born and they tend to make up a large amount of Avernus because well that's where they be so if there is a element in your campaign that you want to have that tie in and have something with blood lying through try not to get that muddled because you may come up with some canon confusion tieflings do get a plus one to their intelligence and get a plus two on their charisma. Now, I hear the confusion already. Why do you get plus two on charisma if people hate you? It's because of the infernal magic in their blood 
that gives them that draws that spell. So sorcerers, bards, they have their spell casting ability as charisma. That's why they get plus two on the charisma. Tieflings age the same as humans, but they do live a little bit longer due to their infernal ancestry. And while tieflings aren't inherently evil, they often find themselves because of the external sources. Evil or not, they tend more often than not to be lawful. There are, of course, exceptions to every rule. Tieflings are medium-sized creatures, no matter how fat they are, with weight and proportions similar to humans, and also have that base speed of 30 feet per round. They do get dark vision, much like the elves we talked about, so dim light same as bright light for 60 feet, and darkness will be dim light for 60 feet. You are naturally resistant to fire damage, and you know the Thaumaturgy can trip and can cast it at will. We'll talk more about that when we get into our magic and all that fun stuff. You can cast Hellish Rebuke at 3rd level, and can cast Darkness at 5th. Regardless of what class you have, you get all those back after a long rest. They just are in your blood, your charisma being that spellcasting ability, much like Sorcerers. And again, we'll be touching on the classes soon. Not only do you speak common, but you are innately able to read, write, and speak Infernal due to the magical nature of your bloodline. Now, this brings us to... I hate these little guys. Honestly, this this was a really hard hard one for me to write. I know a bit about them, but I I have a unreasonable dislike and hatred for gnomes. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it is, but they bother me. Goblins are often considered and referred to as a counterpart to the dwarves. Um, so you you see. Like polar opposites, you get goblins and dwarves opposite opposed. You get orcs and elves opposing opposites. Um, although with the introduction of Drow, you have that, and then the orcs and humans are opposing opposites. Gnomes are... When while the gnomes do come in conflict with goblins, of the civilized quote-unquote races, I would put gnomes diametrically opposed to kobolds. <laughs> I happen to like both races. Um, I love kobolds. Um, in our you love kobolds dragons. because of Deacon. Yeah, well, Deacon's <laughs> a cool kobold, but he's not the first kobold that I've ever been in involved in in a in a campaign. But um, so gnomes, they stand about three feet tall and they weigh about forty to fifty pounds, which may actually sound familiar. Um, but beyond artificial exterior traits to my darling little halflings, uh, there are some attitude and origin differences um, involved. Gnomes are jovial and work to live life to the fullest. They have a lifespan of upwards of 500 years, but they talk and act like even with all that time, it's not enough. Um, they surround themselves with trinkets, shiny things, mostly in an unconscious callback to the race being born of gemstones near the dawn of mortality. Um, gnomes tend to speak fast, um, as if they're rushing to get all of their thoughts out, um, but are also incredibly attentive listeners. Gnomes make excellent, albeit slightly annoying, cheerleaders. Um, I I happen to like gnomes. I I think they're adorable. I, I think my big problem with them is that no matter how much energy I have, I will never have as much energy as a gnome. <laughs> now, the gnomes do tend to live closer to the surface than dwarves. Their cities often bleeding out from the hills and caves into wooded areas. If there was some strange hybrid of a dwarf and elf, it would probably look an awful lot like a gnome. Hyperactive little buggers. They're also quite industrious. They are working as engineers, gem cutters, sages, and tinkers. In canon, the first artificers were actually gnomes. And you'll often see them 
bleeding the science into the magical world of Dungeons and Dragons. A gnome's desire to see and experience everything lends them quite easily to the adventurous life. Now, your average gnome gets a bonus, um, a plus two bonus to their intelligence. They mature at the same rate as humans. Well, physically, anyway. Um, most are expected to settle down in an adult life. Heavy air quote. Yes. Um, around 40 years of age. Uh, they can live anywhere from 350 to 500 years. Gnomes are often good, and they vary between lawful and chaotic. So any one of those three, lawful, neutral, or chaotic, they can be. Um, and it usually depends on what career they choose. They are small Example, if they're going to be an engineer, they're typically more lawful. Of course, mm -hmm. if they go with the artistry side of the gnome world, they go more chaotic. Right. Um, they are small sized creatures like the halflings, so they have a 25 foot um, walking speed. Um, they also get dark vision um, and they get an advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, um, and charisma saving throws against magic. Um, and you get to know gnomish and common. Um, now we're going to talk about the two main types of the gnome. The forest gnome has a natural knack for a loop. You're faster, you're sneakier, and possibly the most reclusive of all the D&D core playable races. It is not uncommon for the inexperienced adventurer who somehow accidentally discovers one of their forest communities to mistake these gnomes for part of the Fey folk. Forest gnomes get a plus one to their dexterity, they will know the minor illusion cantrip regardless of class, and they can natively speak with small beasts like squirrels, rabbits, badgers without having to cast any spells, they just can talk to small forest animals to create a small furry spy network. <laughs> then we have the rock gnomes. Um, these are the more common gnomes that you'll find around Faerun. Um, they're natural tinkerers and are often invent inventors. They do get a plus one to their constitution score. Um, they also get a bonus on history checks related to magic items, alchemical uh, objects, or even techni technological devices. Um, and they get double proficiency in those. You also will have proficiency with Tinker's Tools and can even make clockwork devices if you want if you want to spend that time in the materials to make them. And they're fun little knickknack. Give you a little bit of paper. But now Well, I mean in my in my one campaign, um I'm playing a halfling and we have a we have a gnome tinkerer. And um he tinkered with my with my halfling's short bow and gave him um, rechargeable shot. So I never have to use an arrow as long as I have that little rune covered thing around my short bow. So yeah, yeah. gnome tinkerers are not bad. No, they're, they're not, not bad to have around. They they do have uses when they're not blowing shit up. <laughs> but now. Onto the half breed. We're going to go over this one, the first one, fairly quickly because it is honestly fairly similar to the elf because it's the half elf. It is the race when you want to be an elf but don't want to commit fully to the centuries of life. Half elves look elven to humans but human to elves. Despite that, they're not out of place in either world. They typically are diplomats, scholars, and public officials, easily feeling at home in any community, really. And while not uncommon, there are secluded pockets where people wouldn't even know that a half-elf was possible. The half-elf in those areas, they may exist years without seeing another of their kind. 
but you will frequently see half elves in the major cities like Waterdeep, Neverwinter, Baldur's Gate. Um, places like that. But because of their great abilities, they rarely go out into the rural area. They there is a slight issue with their natural great ambassador ability. The only group that they can't negotiate between effectively, ironically, are the elves and humans. While they do get the best of both of their parent races, the half elves, either the elf or the human, will think the half elf is favoring the other side in negotiation. <laughs> So, mechanically speaking, half-elves get a plus two to charisma, and they get a plus one to two other stats of your choice. Half-elves are about the same size as humans, ranging between five and six feet tall. Um, they are medium-sized creatures with a walking speed of 30 feet. They also get dark vision like elves, um, and they get to keep the fey ancestry traits of the elves um, and they can learn to to trance uh, like the elves the reverie that I talked about last week um, if the DM allows it half elves mature to adulthood around 20 um, but they live much shorter lives than, than elves do living to be about 180 years old um, as a half elf, you gain proficiency of two skills of your choice. You also get to know Elvish, common, and one other language. And I, I want to make a point there that gaining additional proficiencies that's making my necromancer OP. <laughs> so I have a half elf necromancer that I just started playing, and yeah, it's a sage background, which we'll get into those after we get go through classes. Um, so we have sage, half elf, and then the proficiencies that come with being a wizard. I've got like six different proficiencies, not counting that I had a really good role for stats with him. There's virtually nothing I can't do. <laughs> For what I want him to do anyway. <laughs> there, it is so important to keep that in mind. If you're looking for a jack of all trades character, that additional two proficiencies right off the bat mm -hmm. puts you a step above most. Yeah, that's true. Um, so now we'll talk about the other half. Um, I, I see what you like, did there. Yeah, um, I kind of like this um, this race, although I have not ever played one um, as of yet. Um, half orcs. Um, they are the flip side of the half elves. Now there are several ways that the half orc could come about, um, be it the magical union by a warlock. Um, fighting to a standstill between um, warring tribes of, of orcs and humans or other, uh, shall we say, less pleasant methods. Half yeah, orcs, we'll just gloss over that. Yeah. Half-orcs are brutal. Uh, they mainly live in the orc tribes as the human and other civilized societies treat them with disdain. Uh, to this end, they often become adventurers um, to perform great feats before becoming accepted. Half-orcs tend to have grayish skin tone, um, sloping foreheads, jutting jaws, and prominent teeth. Um, they have towering builds between five and seven feet. Their orcish heritage really isn't that hard to see. Um, orcs use scarring to denote status among their clan. 
certain scars show power, but most half-orcs will show the scars of well, slavery. Um, I really do tend to like half-orcs. Um, I've played in a couple of campaigns with half-orcs. I'm in one right now um, with an NPC who's an half-orc barbarian. And uh, she's incredible. Um, so I, I like them because, yes, they are brutal. They're probably more fit to play barbarians uh, or to be barbarians. Um, Usually simply for that heavy reason. in the martial classes. Um, it does work very well. And in a few moments, we'll get with their, why that works well. But the thing I like with the half orc is much like tieflings it is a built-in redemption arc story mm -hmm. showing how i can be better than i was before mm -hmm. um or proving society wrong about what they think of. Mm -hmm. right um so in order to kind of sort of understand half orc um let's look at um orcs um, to begin with. Orcs were created by the one-eyed god Grunsh, and even orcs who turn away from his worship can't escape his influence. Um, so the same is true for half-orcs. Um, though it is tempered by their human side, some half-orcs will hear the whisper of Grunsh calling them to unleash the rage that lies within. Others fail, fall easily to their bloodlust. While not evil in nature, they have a struggle with the savagery and darkness within. Half-orcs, when living in human lands, either are in tribes outside of everything, or they live in the slums of the cities. Life pretty much is difficult for a half-orc. Now, playing at the half-orc, you get an automatic plus two your strength and plus one to constitution. So again, leaning heavily into those martial classes, paladins, warriors, um, even barbarians. They age faster than humans, reaching maturity around the age of 14, and living to be no more than 75 years old. Not counting death by violent means. If they grow to full age, 75 years old. They tend towards chaotic alignments and are not strongly compelled towards good. Most half work will either be on the self-serving evil side or stay in neutral. Um, orcs, half orcs again, they're medium creatures. Most playable races are. They also have movement speed of 30. Most playable races do. Now, they do get dark vision as well, but now we have to get to the real interesting part. Half-orcs have a proficiency with intimidation due to their menacing stature. And here's the really slightly overpowered thing about half-orcs in the front lines of combat. The first time when an attack would take them down to half, or take them down to zero hit point, they're not dropped to zero is to get dropped to one. It can only be used once without a long rest, but it can be the difference between losing a fight and squeaking out a win at the end. Mm -hmm. Half-orcs also get stronger criticals, getting to roll the damage die twice on any melee critical in addition to normal critical damage. So let, let me put that into perspective again. You have your normal attack damage. You get to roll your attack damage again, and then you roll your critical damage. You're basically getting half of an attack extra. It's... <laughs> kind of why I like Aaron in our, in our other, um, in my other campaign, because um, Aaron can, Aaron can slay. She's I pretty, almost she's pulled Destin bad. as a half-orc, but I didn't like the character I was coming up with a half-orc. 
half orc, so I decided I'd go with the human. Uh, so, there you have all the core races from the player's handbook. Um, there are, of course, other races that you can be um, in many of the other books. Um, um, let's see, I think it's um, um, the Sword Coast. Um, there's Sword Coast, there's Eberron, which gets slept on a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing that people remember out of Eberron is the Warforge. But yeah. Venku are overpowered. <laughs> and no one uses them. They are yeah. way over. Um, Bolo's Guide to Monsters has some player classes. Yes. Uh, player class, the Kobold. I believe this is where the Genensai are from, too, if I'm not mistaken. I believe so. I believe they are. Um, um, and um, Wild Mount also has added. Wild Mount is new. It's based on Critical Role, but, but it is still Wizards of the Coast canon now. And there's um, another one. I forget which one gets us. Uh, there are a few. The I've got them. But, yeah, yeah, I've got them on uh, on D and D Beyond. But, we will uh, dive into those so. later. Yeah, um, just for fun. We want to. We're going to come back and circle back to a lot of the stuff after we get through the core mechanics, and mm -hmm. build on everything. So, just so that you know, um, anything else would be even stranger to see um, in the average world of Faerun um, or Toril and in the average um, um, campaign in Faerun. Um, so you should definitely play accordingly um, to keep things interesting. There really is no sense in playing an extremely rare race um, and ignoring the fact that that race is unusual you can you can play an odd race i mean i play tieflings a lot and that really is probably the most unusual race that i've played but i also understand that the npcs are not going to accept me quite as well because i'm a tiefling and my character reacts accordingly um so so that being said, till next time, I'm Tim Gwain. And I'm Kestrel McKnight. And you've been watching Pillars of Adventuring. May the roles ever be in your favor. <laughs>